All right. All right, thank you, Blakely. And uh, welcome everyone, uh, including those of you who are not yet Validate members. And if you would like to join, uh, Blakely will post a join link in the chat box, and you can also find details uh, in the calendar invite. So please join us. Uh, so as a reminder, we'll be recording this program. So please let Blakely know if you don't want to appear in the final edit. And also, uh, we'll do a joint Q&A at the end. Um, and we would really like you to speak up on the microphone or the camera at the end. Uh, but if you wish, uh, you're a little bit shy, uh, you're welcome to type the questions in the chat. And lastly, before I introduce the speakers, I would just like to personally say uh, that I'm a fairly new member of Validate, having just attended uh, the One Health workshop uh, for the first time. And it was really an amazing experience. Uh, the people that I had, uh, I interacted with, I met for the first time, sharing our ideas, working together. I'm really, really excited. Uh, we're still in communication, we're making plans. And I really believe it's gonna, it's gonna change the game. So I strongly uh, encourage you, how's, hope that's not too much PR, but I really truly believe it. So uh, therefore, I'd like to briefly introduce the speakers. Uh, first speaker, uh, Dr. Eamon Garmley, uh, is a professor of veterinary microbiology at the University at University College uh, Dublin, Ireland. Uh, Eamon is director of the Bovine TB Diagnostics and Immunology Research Laboratory in the School of Veterinary Medicine at UCD. Uh, his lab works on diagnostic blood testing of TB infected animals, a very important tool in the ultimate eradication of bovine TB from the, from the national cattle herds. And Eamon also directs the wildlife BCG vaccination research program for the National Department of Agriculture, Food and Marine. So without further ado, Professor Gormley. Thanks very much, Fred. I'll share my screen here. Thanks very much, everybody, and uh, and uh, thanks to Blakely for for inviting me here and for for Fed for the introduction. And uh, what I'd like to talk to you today about is again sort of sort of some, some of the general principles involved in the the, the vaccination for controlling TB the uh, in, in animals and and of the reasons that we actually might uh, want, want to vaccinate the. Uh, it's a very, very difficult problem uh, working with wildlife naturally because, by by the very nature, they're not they're not easy to access, uh, and quite often there's a, there's a lot we don't know about uh, animal species. So, if we just take a, a small journey around the world, uh, this is only a fraction of the, uh, the the wildlife that have been implicated in in tuberculosis over the last sort of uh, twenty to thirty years. You know, there in the USA, we've got deer, bison, coyotes, fox, raccoon, bear, and bobcat. Um, in in Europe, we've a, a large number of species, but I suppose the most important ones, uh, particularly in Ireland, in the in the UK, are, are badgers and deer. In France, you've also got badgers. Uh, it's less of a problem in Spain, where it's more likely to be the boar, uh, and unfortunately, an endangered species, uh, the, the lynx cat. It's been shown to have uh, a TB. Um, South Africa, look, that's only a fraction of the uh, the, the animals. Uh, that have been shown to have TB, and there's a lot of work going on there. Michelle will talk about that later. The um, but suffice to say, the whole slide would be full of South African animals. You know, if I was to do a complete set, um, Australia traditionally only had the uh, the buffalo and the feral pig, um, and there was very interesting control program um, management strategy for those animals that I'll, I'll briefly touch upon. And then New Zealand, you have a, a, a fairly broad range of wildlife, um, all of which have been sh shown to be uh, infected with tuberculosis. And are involved in the uh, in the transmission to cattle, and particularly the uh, the, the possum there, which I suppose they're they're, they're their main species uh, involved in in transmission to, uh, to to humans. Yeah, you know, transmission chains for zoonotic TB can be very very complex, and they're they're rarely straightforward. Uh, I mean, we're all aware of the you know the the usual sort of drinking uh, contaminated milk. Which you know, which poses a, a public health threat, and historically has been the main reason for the introduction of pasteurisation uh, to remove that threat. 
But again, we still have a lot of TB in cattle, so potentially that milk can get contaminated. Uh, we get interactions between cattle and uh, and wildlife in Ireland with the badgers, and that can be a two-way process. Uh, depending on the particular epidemiological scenario, it can go both ways. Uh, you can have transmission from, from wildlife to, to domestic uh, pets, such as dogs and cats. And of course, these li living in the homes of people, this is not another potential route of uh, of transmission to humans. So, so ultimately, uh, much of our controls are based on the threat to uh, to, to human health. Uh, the risk is fairly low these days because of all the management strategies that have been put in place over the last number of decades. But nonetheless, you can actually see there the way the direction those arrows are, are pointing. There's still a lot of potential for transmission. And indeed, we do see all of those uh, directions of transfer at some level, even, even in Ireland, a country with a well-developed programme. We, we see that every year. Uh, but obviously, there are part places in the world where you don't have pasteurisation, where there's no control programmes, and therefore the risks are actually much higher uh, in, in, in terms of public health risk and transmission to, uh, to, to local communities. Yeah, so you know, large efforts have been expended over the years in many countries to try and reduce, uh, to try and reduce the, the, the risk of trans, transmission. Um, one important point I'd like to make is that infection infection doesn't always mean transmission. For example, you know, so, so so the presence of an infected animal in itself doesn't describe the risk. So, for example, in the Australian campaign, you know, you had feral pigs. You know, they eat infected car uh, carrion, which means they have a high prevalence. But the lesions tend to be very small. There's very little excretion, and there's no interaction with cattle. So these are sort of a classic spillover host. host. And if you get rid of the main source of the disease, then what you find out is that the disease itself uh, dies out in these spillover hosts. Uh, again, in Australia, the fair water buffalo, aerosol infection, very high prevalence, lots of excretion, but again, no interaction. And these are classic maintenance hosts. In other words, the, the disease can be maintained in the buffalo populations without any external source of, of, of reinfection. So the only way to address the the problem of the disease in in maintenance hosts is actually to address it directly with the uh, with the maintenance host. Uh, and then another example is uh, is ferrets, uh, particularly in New Zealand. Uh, that, so they get infected by ingestion of, uh, of of dead possums, for example. So they have a very very high problem, uh, prevalence. Uh, they, there's very limited uh, excretion and there's no interaction with uh, with cattle. And what they found is is that. If you get rid of the, the, the problem in the possum population, then it naturally dies out in the in the ferret population. Yeah. So it's very important that for each wildlife host where you have identified infection, that you need to describe the, the significance of that infection in terms of uh, risk. So I suppose when we talk about significance, we're talking about uh, the, the risk that these could transmit uh, within their own species or transmit to other species. So for each infected host, really what you need to show is, you know, wh wh where are the lesions located? Are these lesions associated with an infection pathway, such as the upper respiratory tract, where you can get sort of excretion from the lungs? You know, what are the roots and levels of excretion? Is it respiratory or is it oral in in ingestion, like we see in some of those uh, scavenger species? And do they excrete lots of uh, of bugs? You know, what are the roots of infection to domestic livestock? What's the minimum effective dose? That's very difficult to establish because when we're talking about transmission to domestic livestock, of course, we're probably only testing the livestock every six months or once a year. So if you do find infection, you're looking at an historical event, uh, which is very hard to identify at some period uh, in the past. And that could have been up to two or three years previously. And again, you have to define what are the main routes uh, that will, will result from interactions between wildlife and, uh, and, and cattle that will result in transmission event. Um, so, you know, the bottom line is, you know, are there interactions that facilitate transmission of infection? Well, you know, if there are, then vaccination, you know, ha has a role to play. Uh, but if not, then th then basically it doesn't. So really, if, you're, if, you, if you want to embark on a wildlife vaccination program, you really want to be sure that the, the wildlife that you're considering to vaccinate is actually involved in the epidemiology of the disease in, in the species that you're interested in. And for example, in, in Ireland, that would be cattle. So basically, depending on the objectives, you know, the, the success of vaccination really depend on the reservoir status of each wildlife species involved. So are they maintenance hosts or are they spillover hosts? Because you could expend a lot of energy and do a lot of work, very costly work, 
end up vaccinating a species that will actually make no difference because that species has actually minimal impact in the transmission of disease to uh, to cattle. So I'll show you the situation in, um, in in Ireland as it pertains to vaccination. So th th these are the number of cattle reactors we've had since the uh, well, basically back six, almost um, 60 years or just over 60 years. And back then, you know, we were turning up 100 and close to 180,000 cattle reactors every year. And that was against a population of cattle that was only about 2 million. So it was a very, very high prevalence rate. The, uh, so what we did then, we started, first of all, a voluntary program of, of testing and removal of animals. And you can see uh, by 1963, then we introduced a compulsory program. In other words, all reactor animals had to be uh, removed in the population. And you can see there was a dramatic uh, decrease in the level of the of the disease in cattle uh, by 1965 to the extent that we actually thought we would have eradicated the disease in the following two to three years but as you can see over the next 50 years it has just sort of bubbled up and down and hasn't actually changed enormously in that period of time so what we're seeing here is the impact of, of culling reactor cattle early in an eradication campaign and it can make a dramatic difference because here you're removing the most diseased animals in your population uh, but as you can see, we reached uh, we reached a static point then, and since then it's sort of I say it's hovered between uh, fifteen and uh, and twenty thousand. It actually hasn't changed uh, much, despite the the, the millions of uh, dollars, euros, or whatever has been spent in the eradication campaign. You know, and this pointed basically to the uh, that we we might have another source of infection, which we identified in nineteen seventy four um, as the uh, as the badger, which we saw as continually seeding. The disease into the cattle population, you know, causing this, um, you know, this sort of up and down figures in cattle reactor rates that has, as I say, hasn't changed much in in in, in fifty years. So we've done a lot of work. We've done a lot of work uh, over the years looking at the, uh, the the various pathways, and you know, it, it's clear that you know, with, with the growth in cattle herds and the industry over the last fifty years, you know, most of the uh, transmission is 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 cattle to cattle. Yeah, and, and and we see that quite quickly as 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 it moves through uh, moves through herds. Yeah, but we do have interactions between badgers down here and uh, and the cattle, and where badgers are heavily infected, and uh, the interactive cattle. Well, there is the potential for transmission to the cattle, either direct or indirect through the environment. Now, when I say the environment there, basically that could be at the farm level, it could be at a region level, it could be at a national level. Uh, it just means it's where 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 they share uh, common land. Uh, that increases the potential for for tr transmission. So we've identified the badger as a maintenance host. In other words, it can self-sustain the disease in the population, yeah, so which makes it actually very difficult to, uh, to, to get out of the population. Um, and again, there's a certain degree uh, of cattle to badger transmission, uh, this arrow coming down here. Uh, that, that's less likely because we have a sort of an intensive annual testing campaign of cattle. The, uh, so we're removing diseased animals all the time. So that reduces the risk to the badger. So the way we manage this is, you know, traditionally we've been culling animals that are reactors. So that's actually reduced the level of transmission between the cattle, as you saw from, from 1963. Um, uh, and we've been managing it in badgers through culling. But the badger is a protected species in Ireland. Nobody wants it eradicated. Uh, it's only, it, they're, they're only culled in response to TB outbreaks. But we don't see that as a, a sustainable solution because unless you kill all of the badgers, you're always going to get some level of transmission between the badgers and the cattle. So whereas we're controlling it in cattle, traditionally we haven't really been controlling it very well in the in the in the in, in the in the badger. So this sort of led us to the uh, the strategy over the last sort of 25, 30 years that you know that the well the, the simplest but by by no means the easiest way to address the problem would be to vaccinate the the badgers. So we started off a major vaccine development program just over uh, sort of 25 years ago. We knew very little about the immunology of TB and badgers. We knew very little about TB and badgers. Yeah, so we did a lot of pen studies with captive badgers where we developed a lot of diagnostic tests. This was in, com this was in collaboration with our good colleagues in uh, APHA in the UK who had the same problem. So we shared our resources there very effectively uh, to try and uh, come up with diagnostics. Uh, we actually achieved that in the in space about 10 years. We have antibody assays, we have PCR assays, we have gamut fear assays. Uh, so lots, lots of assays that we can use for, for diagnostics. We brought all this together for a field trial, major field trial to see would the vaccine actually work. 
Uh, that finished in 2014. Um, and since then, we have been looking at uh, how we apply the, the, the vaccine in the field and various issues uh, related to registration of the vaccine. And all this uh, sort of came together in 2018 when we actually started field vaccination badgers as part of the national uh, eradication programme. So look, in, the, in this slide, I'm I'm summarising 20 years of work in, in, in three points because, you know, I could spend a long time going over the various studies that we did. Uh, but basically, the, the, these are the main findings we're looking with captive badger studies. You know, so we developed immunodiagnostics for tuberculosis in badgers. We developed an infection model. You can see here, we can, we can put the the infection directly into the different lobes of the lung. And we use this as a measure of, of, uh, of a vaccine effect, basically by counting lesions. We determine the protective efficacy of BCG yeah, uh, by a number of different routes, whether we give it uh, orally or subcutaneous or intramuscular. And basically what we found is it doesn't really matter what route you give, uh, you still get good protection. Yeah, and We also tested the efficacy of an oral BCG vaccine, we compared uh, different back BCT vaccine strains, Pasteur versus Danish being the main ones, uh, and found no difference there. And again, we looked at different delivery formats, uh, particularly for the oral vaccination um, strategy, but also for intramuscular and subcutaneous. So with, with those successes, we decided to move to the next stage, which is, is basically is the, uh, is the real stage where you want to get to, is, you know, basically... You know, it's one thing demonstrating that the vaccine works in a in a, in a controlled ex experimental um, fr framework, but what you really want to show is the protective in, in in wild animals under all the natural transmission conditions and all the confounders that you would get out with working with wild animals. Uh, we wanted to estimate vaccine efficacy. The secondary objectives were to study post infection vaccination because for almost sort of sixty years. We've been told that if you vaccinate an animal that's already infected, it's actually going to make the disease worse. So this was going to give us a good opportunity to look at that. And again, I suppose, most importantly, it, it helped us look at the infrastructure for the research, for trapping population dynamics, behaviour of the animals. And this would help address policy issues and scientific interests. In other words, you know, we have the vaccine, we have the, we have the environment. How do we go about how do we go about implementing a vaccine strategy in a, in a rational way that's likely to give us some success or maximize success? So the vaccine trial took place in an area we called County Kilkenny. This was the, as far as you're aware, it's the largest uh, wildlife TB vaccine campaign ever conducted over an area of about 770 square kilometers. The area was divided into three zones one, two, three. So in the top zone, and again, this was all blind at the time of the vaccination, we gave 100% uh, either vaccination or placebo. The middle zone was 50-50. And the third zone, again, was either vaccine or or, or, or placebo. They are, are the opposite to, to zone one. The, the, the idea here is that we would have a gradient of vaccination uh, with which we can measure or, or get an estimate of transmission rates and the impact of the vaccine on 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 reducing transmission rates. Um, you know, as it turned out, you know, zo zone one ended up with placebo, and zone three ended up with the 100% vaccination, and as I say, 50-50 uh, in in the middle zone. And this was all blinded, uh, and so it was only at the end of the trial that we actually broke the codes uh, to see which animals were vaccinated and which were not. Uh, and this took place over three years with seven sweeps, two sweeps a year going through each zone, and then a seventh sweep to actually remove the animals at the end to see what the disease prevalence uh, was like. Yeah. There are different ways of measuring disease efficacy. We took a blood sample at each at each, at each uh, trapping, and we looked at the, the rate of seroconversion to a positive uh, uh, serological result uh, in the non-vaccinates and the vaccinates. And you can you can... What we were looking to see was there any impact in the in the in the rate at which animals uh, converted to um, zero positive against a, a major TB antigen. So you can see you can hear the uh, the sort of graph looks at the day to zero conversion among the non vaccinates and the vaccinates. You know, and straight away, you know, one way you can look at it and say, well, you know, how long does it take for fifty percent of the animals to to uh, to zero convert? And you can see here that in the non-vaccinates, 50% were seroconverting at about 160 days, whereas there was a delay in the vaccinates, which told us it was probably slowed down in the progression of infection in these animals. Another way of looking at it is to say, well, after 300 days of vaccination, what proportion of your population uh, has actually uh, seroconverted? And you can see here, after 300 days, it's only about 30% of the vaccinates 
and uh, almost 70 percent of the non-vaccinates so straight away just using sort of the kinetics of serial conversion we're starting to see a difference in the, in, in the rates of serial conversion which we're using as a proxy for uh, infection so we can convert that into a, a, what we call a hazard rate ratio to estimate vaccine efficacy. And it's quite a simple, simple formula. So basically, again, it's just based on the, the, the number of days to zero conversion. So you can see in the first year, the, uh, um, the average time to zero conversion among the non-vaccinates was 1,100 days. And it was a little bit longer for the vaccinate. Only 12 animals vaccinated among, sorry, among the non-vaccinated zero converted and 10 among the vaccinated. So there's no real effect there after after one year but it, it gives us sort of a crude estimate of about uh 36 percent uh, vaccine efficacy based on those figures but then in sweeps three to six which basically represented the second half of the study now we're starting to see big differences so it's the, the mean zero conversion is 858 for the non-vaccinates over thousand for vaccinates only five percent of the vaccinated animals converted uh in the, in the in the second half of the trial compared to 22 percent of the of the non-vaccinates so again just by using those figures we can get a hazard ratio and convert that to a, a vaccine efficacy of about 84 percent so this was very uh this was very encouraging that in the space of three years that we could actually see a dramatic impact of the vaccine among those vaccinated populations at the end of the study we took out a lot of badgers and actually did a post-mortem examination yeah to see well what was the pathological impact of of uh, vaccination and you can see here in zone A, which got the placebo, there was 15 animals came up with lesions, whereas in zone C, where we had the, the vaccine, there was only five. So that's a threefold decrease. Again, exactly, it's the same with the badgers confirmed with Mbovus by culture, 38 and 16. We didn't see we didn't see any real difference between the um the the vaccine and the control in 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 the in, in the mixed zone. That's probably down to, to 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 clustering and just sort of random effects. But one interesting finding is that even among vaccinates and non-vaccinates, non among the animals that were infected, uh, there was very little difference in pathology. You know, 58% of them had an infected thorax, same in the, in the vaccinates, same for the number of sites of infection and the severity scores. So this fits in exactly with what we know about BCG vaccina vaccination. In other words, that if you are vaccinated and the vaccine doesn't work the, and you get infected, the disease profile is no different than if you're not vaccinated at all. And this has been shown in other species and it's been shown in humans. So and it's, it's exactly what I expect. And it was, again, it was encouraging to see this effect. So it looks as if you are infected, if you are vaccinated, you are infected. That uh, it seems that it will have little impact on the transmission of those animals, uh, of infection from those animals. But, but, but overall, it does tell us that you were getting a lot of sort of sterile protection among that uh, population. So what have we learned with all these studies? Well, again, with captive badgers, we've shown that it protects against TB when delivered by any number of, um, of routes. The, uh, in wild badgers, again, BCG vaccination protects under natural transmission conditions where there's lots of variables that we can't control. In other words, there's over three years, there's a lot of population turnover. There's capture frequency, you know, how often we capture the same badger uh, during the trial. Of course, is the interval between vaccination and infection, which we can't really know. The, um, uh, so the fact that we do actually measure an effect, given all these confounders, tells us the vaccine is actually probably working much better uh, than, we, than, than we thought it was. What we found again from that year one to year three is again that the vaccine efficacy increases as the proportion of the population that's vaccinated increases. And again, this is just that concept of, uh, of, of herd immunity. In other words, as you increase your vaccination coverage, more and more animals become resistant and therefore the disease starts to starts to die out. So th that's exactly what you expect, increased vaccine efficacy uh, over time. Uh, very important one here with high vaccine coverage, which we had here, we estimate we probably vaccinated about 80 percent of the populations in, 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 the, in, in, in the zones. So with high vaccine coverage, there's a strong indirect effect of vaccination on non-vaccinated badgers. And what I mean by that is that on the very last sweep, of course, we captured a whole new generation of badgers that never got vaccine. And in that zone where we'd vaccinated all the badgers, among this population, there was zero infection in the animals. So this was sort of a very profound indirect effect of vaccination. Again, it's, which is what we predicted, uh, but it was very interesting to see that. And, and what we found in the, in the zone that got the placebo is that there was no difference in the prevalence of infection in the badgers at the end that there was in the beginning. Again, that's exactly what you'd expect. Yeah. 
So, uh, so, so yeah. So, so we get uh, we get very good vaccine efficacy among those that are vaccinated, and we get a very good strong indirect effects of vaccination on the non-vaccinated population. Um, you know, the question is asked, well, how many badgers do we need to, uh, to, to vaccinate to get herd immunity? Uh, we reckon from our studies and with a bit of mathematical modelling that's still uh, ongoing, that all, all we need to do is maybe get 30 to 40 percent of our population vaccinated. Yeah, and then we we'll get some sort of level of uh, of herd immunity in the population. Uh, but again, that, that that remains to be seen, and we, we we've ongoing studies uh, looking at that, repeating the vaccination in, in in a large number of areas, yeah, where we can actually look at the uh, the, the local effects of, of of vaccination. So again, because of the success of that uh, the success of that uh, project, uh, national uh, the vaccination budgets became part of national uh, policy in in 2018. Um, and now what we're doing is we're uh, we're vaccinating about in 20, 2022 we vaccinated about 7,000 uh, badgers in areas where traditionally we, we we would have culled. So our, our national strategy now is to uh, is we would cull badgers in response to TB breakdowns in cattle where we believe that badgers are responsible. Um, and then we we'll vaccinate the incoming population of, of badgers to prevent, TB, to, to prevent TB breakdowns. So effectively what we're doing is we're, we're replacing, we're using vaccination to replace a susceptible population of badgers with the protected vaccinated population of, uh, of badgers. Um, and, and over time, as we vaccinate every year in those areas, we're building up our, our coverage uh, so what we hope is to get maybe 80, 90 percent of the badgers in an area uh, protected from from, from TB. Uh, the main impact of that is is that it means that farmers can't or that they're less likely to to blame badgers for the problems. And it shifts the focus away from the wildlife uh, to, to look at actually cattle to cattle transmission, which is the dominant uh, route of transmission. You know, it's very easy when you get large breakdowns to say, oh, well, if the badgers, you must cull them. But if we can demonstrate that we've actually got a vaccine protected population, uh, then there's less justification for culling. And again, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a protected species. So we're bound by national and international agreements uh, that we try and, uh, and finish up the culling. So th this is how we do it. So you can see here on the left, on, on the left, these were the main TB clusters in cattle. In the uh, in in twenty twenty one, these maps don't tend to change over the years. It tends to be the same areas uh, over and over again. And you can see on the right hand side, the the yellow is where we actually cull uh, the badgers. And you can see they're mainly the areas where those TB breakdowns are are showing up here in the uh, in the in the right panel. And um, but basically, what's happening now is that in those in those areas of yellow, uh, when we cull for a number of years then we switch over those areas to, to vaccination. So you can see here, these green areas here now uh, have taken over, are beginning to take over where we, previously we, we culled. Uh, now we're vaccinating um, in, in those counties. So for example, in this county here, County Louth, uh, we've, we're almost turned over to 100% uh, to uh, vaccination of badgers in those, um, in those counties. Uh, and again, what we what we want to do now over the next couple of years is expand that out so that all those yellow areas we've been culling uh, become uh, become green. Uh, now there are still some areas where we get large breakdowns and we go in and, and we test the badgers and we find there's a high level of disease in them. Uh, and and when we find that uh, vaccination will have very little impact, and so the only solution really there is to continue culling in those areas. Uh, but again, after two years of culling, then we bring in vaccination and then we start. Uh, we start uh, growing up, a, a, say, a population of resistant badgers among the emerging population or among a new immigrant population moving into those particular areas. Yeah, but there are, look, there are a lot of challenges to uh, to vaccination of wildlife. You, you know, there's a large number of stakeholders involved in, in disease and, and perception is everything. You know, farmers like to blame the uh, farmers like to blame everybody else. They like to blame the government because they're saying, look, this is a protected species. The government is protecting a species that's actually causing us uh, a problem. So why should we pay for it? It should be the government that's paid for it. Uh, culling is quick. It's effective. It removes the problem straight away. Uh, vaccine is, is much slower. It's a much longer term effect. Uh, we can't wait that long. It may end up more expensive than in the long run. Uh, governments have got their own responsibilities. You know, they see it uh, differently. Uh, environmentalists, uh, you know, quite naturally are, are against uh, culling 
and are in favour of in, in, in vaccination. So you have all these arguments sort of continuing over the years. And, and, and I suppose until we can sort of uh, sort of inform them by the science and, and show without doubt that the vaccine is actually having an impact on cattle rates, uh, then these arguments will continue. The, uh, again, vaccine efficacy and effectiveness, it's one thing having a, a good vaccine, but is it really effective? In other words, if we uh, if we vaccinate 90% of the batteries in the country, but we're still getting large number of breakdowns in cattle, which may be due to cattle to cattle transmission, but of course the the, the vaccine will be the first to get the uh, the blame, and you know, and, and we see that with the experience internationally of COVID vaccination uh, over the last couple of years, it's very easy to blame the vaccine for all your problems. Um, again, the type of vaccine immunity that we're looking at, you know, are we trying to protect against infection? Are we trying to protect against severity? Are we trying to protect against transmission? You know, these all, all, all will have different impacts on the disease in the uh, in, in the badger population and for transmission to cattle. You know, the vaccine coverage the population. Again, how do you get to the maximum number of animals that you want to vaccinate? And how, how do you know you've got the population? We, we, we do tag all our badgers that we vaccinate uh, again, but there's lots of badgers out there that we actually just don't catch. You know, our primary aim from a scientist's point of view is to reduce that sort of or not the transmission rate. Um, and if we do that, we know the disease will come down. But of course, there's all these local factors in a, in a farm area. There's the density of badgers, the density of cattle, there's the prevalence of disease. Again, that's reflected in the, in, in the vaccination coverage. So whereas we might be able to show a vaccine efficacy of 70 percent over a large area, you know, well, a farmer is only interested in his small area. You know, with particular local factors, and is 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 the badger effective in those small areas where, where we're working with? Um, time and costs of the enemy. Look, all TB control uh, is is expensive. You know, we 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 are spending a hundred million euro a year, and we've been doing that for effectively for fifty years. Some would argue that it's been a waste of uh, waste of money and and a waste of time. You know, if you're doing vaccine trials, it takes a long time to get the trials uh, to, to get out from the trials to implementation. Um, and the biggest question is always, you know, stakeholder engagement. Everybody needs to be involved. You know, who pays, uh, who benefits, who doesn't benefit. They'll argue that they shouldn't be paying. So there are major rows and arguments to have in, in, in those areas. But I'd like to show you some examples of, you know, how you can actually change perceptions. Now, here are some of the headlines that we faced 10, 15 years ago uh, when there was a lot of um, sort of angst and blame uh, of, of the battles for TB, and if you if you if you if you look at the headlines, you know they hear like farmer who backed badger calls hits out a terrorist animal campaigners, uh, badgers war on family, uh, badger call protest hijacked by violent extremes, the British blamed for Basra badgers. You know it's hard to believe we're talking about sort of an innocent wildlife species here, and when you see the language that's been used here, you know it's it's all the, the metaphors of war, you know, and this is all to this is all designed to polarise opinion, to put people on one side or the other saying, well, we should call or we shouldn't call. Yeah. And it's not it's not it's not really fair. It's never it's never that black and white. Excuse the pun. Yeah. But th this is the type of language uh, that you 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 constantly see in the uh, or we used to constantly see in the in the press. The, uh, so, you know, to, to try and avoid this, we, we spent a lot of effort actually going out, building support for a vaccine programme. You know, and, you know, doing uh, sort of TV programs with the national TV broadcaster, radio programs, explaining to farmers the whole purpose of the program, explaining the danger that infected badgers uh, pose to their pose to their uh, to the farms. What we did was we developed an app. So there's an app now that the farmers have and they can report where all the sets are, where the badgers live. And then that goes into a national database. And then the government uh, inspectors go out and inspect these sets. And look to see are the um, are the badgers living there? Are they likely to be uh, infected? And all this is a way of sort of building up, sort of engaging with stakeholders and, and showing them, you know, that they're that, you know, as well as being part of the problem, they're actually part of the solution. So by bringing everybody together by, along, you actually get good stakeholder in, engagement, and they can actually see uh, the purpose in the program. And, and this has been quite effective because I mean these these are the more recent type of headlines that we see. The uh, vaccine win and TB battle, uh, badger vaccine trial results are in. It's all good news for cattle farmers. Obviously, the farming uh, organisations uh, urge caution, but they but they welcome it. Uh, look, here's even the, the Donald Trump apparently was obsessed uh, with, with badgers. So I, I hope he heard he heard the news that uh, that the vaccination works. 
Yeah. So you can see you actually can change hearts and minds, but it means you just don't focus on the science or you just don't focus on the field work. You basically have to bring all stakeholders together and by getting them all involved, then actually it makes it much easier to uh, to progress your uh, your program. The, so, look, uh, I'll finish off there and say, well, how do we resolve polarized opinion or how do we resolve it? You know, again, there's basically two main sort of frames. There's the agricultural frame is that, you know, wildlife interfere with human activity. They need to be controlled because, as we know, most emerging diseases come out of wildlife. Therefore, wildlife are bad they, and, and they need to be controlled. Then you've got the environmental frame is that wildlife of high conservation value. Disease is normal. So stakeholders must to adapt. That's the way things are. That's the way we should live with it. Uh, I think we'll hear more about that from, from Michelle in her talk from uh, from South Africa. And I suppose the way we've we've approached this is, you know, we, we recognize these two very important but opposite frames. But what we've tried to do is put the put the disease central. And if you put the disease in the center, frame it around the disease, uh, then basically you, you find a lot of common points between the agricultural and the environment environmental frame. And it's much easier to get all stakeholders uh, on, on, on board. So, look, I'm, I'm going to finish off with uh, acknowledgements, but I'm just going to comment uh, just a little bit on, on how this was done. So, yeah, so the, the lab I work in, we, we did all the scientific work when it came to doing the, uh, the, the, the vaccine studies and the vaccine trial, you know, and the center, for the, the epidemiology center sort of helped with the whole epidemiology and understanding the factors of disease. And all this work was, was funded by the Department of Agriculture and the Marine. Um, but this was a three-way process. This wasn't a case where we applied for grants and said we would actually uh, we would like to do this and we would like to do that. Um, basically, this was actually driven by the Department of Agriculture. Uh, they decided 25 years ago that this was the strategy that they wanted. They wanted to develop a vaccine. Uh, so they got me involved, my laboratory involved, and, and we worked with them, not for them. You know, in, in other words, the what we did is we always tried to link the science that we produced to the likely policies that they were going to come up with, so that there was no conflict between the science and the uh, and the uh, and the policy, and that's really important. You know, if you're a, if you're setting out sort of an ambitious program to to implement a large scale vaccine program, you really need to get your government, uh, your Department of Agriculture in, in involved, because without buy in from them, basically you're just reduced to doing experiments and publishing papers, but you're actually not going to actually get into the field and, and, and have, have, have an impact where you want it to be. So, you know, I'd, I'd like to acknowledge, you know, the, uh, you know, the, the Department of Agriculture often gets sort of a, a bad rap when it comes to supporting science. Uh, but I must say, uh, much of the science was, was, was driven by the, uh, well, no, sorry, the other way around, the, um, the, the policies that have come up for vaccination culling was driven by the science, not the other way around. Uh, and again, that's really important when it comes to actually trying to control the disease. Uh, where are we now? We're sort of hopeful uh, our reactor rates are up a little bit this year, but our, our, our vaccine program is, is going uh, full speed. Yeah, and we're hoping with other projects that hopefully in the next five years, actually we'll actually start to see uh, tangible benefits of, of vaccination of wildlife uh, and hope that will sort of inspire others in different countries that actually this is an approach uh, worth taking in, in, in the long term. So thank you very much. So... Well, thank you very much, uh, Professor Gormley. And uh, before I introduce uh, Dr. Miller, I uh, just want to remind everybody that uh, the question and answer session will be at the end. And if you would, we would love to have you ask your questions in person. But again, if, if you would prefer to type them in, that's also fine. So, but thanks. Thank you, Dr. Gormley. Thank you. Uh, so our next speaker is Dr. Michelle Miller, uh, professor and the South African Research Chair in Animal Tuberculosis at Stellenbosch University, South Africa. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Michelle received her MS and PhD degrees in immunology and a DVM from the University of Wisconsin-Madison in the U.S. and a master's in public health at the University of Florida, Gainesville. Uh, Michelle is also a diplomat of the European College of Zoological Medicine. She moved to South Africa in 2013 and is currently the uh, NRF South African Research Chair in Animal TB at Stellenbosch, uh, although she is based full-time in Kruger National Park. 
So Michelle is actively involved in wildlife research, particularly focusing on TB and other zoonotic diseases at the human animal environmental interfaces. So without again, further ado, thank you, Professor Miller. Thank you, Fred, for the introduction. Um, I just am going to stop my video uh, just because I have somewhat weak um, internet. And let me just pull up my presentation. Um, uh, Fred, can you confirm that you can see the presentation and hear me? Yep, it sounds great and looks great. Great. Well, thank you. I, um, I'm very honored to have been invited to speak to all of you today, and I'm very excited because especially talking with um, all of you, you've just heard what um, Ireland has done, an amazing job. They serve as a role model for us uh, working with um, TB and wildlife, and I think it will be very interesting to see the contrast um, between Ireland and, and wildlife TB in South Africa. So today I'm just going to describe basically the tip of the iceberg, which is TB in South African wildlife. Um, oftentimes as scientists or clinicians, what we see is just the top of the iceberg, the state of the health of the individual or the population or um, the national herd, those, those type of things. But what we don't realize is that oftentimes there's many different um, other factors that are going to influence that outcome of health that we see. And Eamon mentioned some of those, such as getting your stakeholders involved um, and you know changing some of the behavior toward uh, diseased badger, for instance, or um, vaccine hesitancy. So I think it's really important that we don't forget that we need to go beyond just testing our animals and, and saying we have X percent um, prevalence and then go from there. So in the case of TB and wildlife in South Africa in particular, um, there are many, many factors that are under the water level or under the radar, we would say. So some of the obvious ones would be, what is the status of TB in our livestock and our human populations? But also there are a lot of other things that impact what that um, what we're seeing about the surface, such, such as changes in habitat loss or the environment, um, such as, as drought that we periodically experience. In South Africa, we have a lot of illegal or uncontrolled movement of animals, and we have very few resources for animal health, unlike, as we heard in Ireland, 100 million euros that are dedicated to the TB control program on an annual basis. And then also, um, as Eamon had said, it took decades to develop the tools that were used for surveillance diagnosis and vaccine development. And that is something that, that we really haven't had in, in South Africa. So specifically talking about um, wildlife in South Africa, our African buffalo are really the tip of the iceberg when it comes to TB and wildlife. They're the only species that have any type of um, controlled disease regulations um, and regular testing. So buffalo in South Africa cannot be moved between um, game reserves or private farms without testing. Uh, unfortunately, that's not as uh, well done in the um, livestock industry. For instance, our communal farmers often will move animals without testing, even though our bovine TB control program does uh, specify that they should be tested and move under um, permit. But under the iceberg, as, as um, Eamon mentioned, it's not just one species that we're focused on, the buffalo. In fact, we have interfaces with a lot of different species. The buffalo um, is just the tip of the iceberg and has been 
uh, villainized by many people um, as causing TB and all of these other species. And um, so we have a lot of work to do in terms of stakeholder perception and, and correcting that. So I wanted to give you a little bit of a history of, of TB and Buffalo and Kruger National Park in particular. Um, we believe that TB was introduced to the Buffalo in the park along the southern border back in the late 1950s or early 1960s, um, because at that time, the prevalence of M. bovis infection in cattle um, was still quite high. They hadn't introduced the control program until the mid 60s. And so um, again, there were a lot of infected animals um, surrounding uh, the Kruger National Park. So um, unfortunately, they never really diagnosed TB in the buffalo population in Kruger National Park until 1990. So as you can see, that's 40 to 50 years in which the infection was able to get established in the buffalo population. Once that was found, um, then there was obviously quite uh, a lot of concern. And the question was, it, does there need to be any type of intervention? So initially they did surveillance and they found that um, Ambovis was moving northwards in the park um, by 2005. So approximately 15 years after the index case, it had already spread throughout the park. And in a few years later, it also moved into Buffalo populations in Zimbabwe. And because we don't have a fence between the parks in Kruger um, in South Africa and Limpopo in Mozambique, we also believe that has, has spread over to Mozambique, but, but we don't have specific information. Can you hear me all right now? Yes. Okay, um, so um, as I mentioned, it was introduced with cattle and at that point in time, um, it really wasn't under any type of uh, surveillance or control. So cattle were moving all over the country and it was only in the 1970s roughly that they really recognized that TB and wildlife might be a potential problem. And you can see the list of species that were discovered with um, M. bovis infection over, over the period of time. We have two national parks that are now have uh, M. bovis endemic in their wildlife populations. That's Kruger and Amphalosi Shishlui. However, um, since that time, we started looking for TB and wildlife because we didn't know if it was a problem. And we now have found M. bovis infection in 25 different wildlife species in South Africa. And this continues to go up as we improve our um, surveillance and our diagnostic tools. So now the red circles are expanding and we have infected wildlife in uh, multiple areas of the country. Um, and at this point, people are still wondering exactly what they need to do about it. Um, you know, we're, we're a few decades behind Ireland. So why is it spreading? One of the things is that private wildlife ownership is allowed in South Africa. And as you can see from the figure on the left, um, the uh, wildlife industry has really um, been increasing. And in 2014, it was estimated that about 30,000 individual wildlife animals were moved and sold at auctions in South Africa. So that's only at auctions. Um, there's lots of private um, uh, owners that will, will sell and also translocation from parks. So you can imagine that there's a lot of animals being moved. And because the only species that has to be tested is buffalo, oftentimes these animals get brought to a auction um, arena pen. They will be mixed um, from different sources. 
there is no history of the health of the animals and there's no um, TB testing. So you can see how this could easily be spread. And the other issue we contend with is private wildlife are often managed under more intensive conditions, which we know in cattle, of course, um, increase the risk of disease transmission, not just of TB, but other infectious diseases as well. And then there is a lot of unintentional wildlife movement. So um, animals jump over fences. The middle picture is a warthog going under a fence and an elephant breaking through a fence. So these are common occurrences and um, also increase the risk of disease moving with those particular individuals. So how is TB transmitted in our wildlife? Um, as Amen said, it's a very complex e epidemiology. And so we have both intra and interspecies transmission, as well as indirect transmission from the environment. And at this point, it's uh, something that we're still studying is to know which species can act as uh, reservoir hosts versus those that are spillover hosts and um, that we have to be less concerned about. So um, an obvious um, example is TB and lions. And as you can see in the left um, photograph, if you have a buffalo that is has suspected TB and the lions are able to um, catch that animal because they're a little bit slower, um, not as able to keep up with the herd, then obviously the animals um, can be infected through the oral route um, by ingesting uh, infected um, uh, pieces of the carcass. Um, what ends up happening as lions is they can develop um, bone or joint infection. You see a young lion at the top right that has developed a swollen elbow that's very pathognomonic in lions. That's called the elbow high groma. And in Kruger, if you see an lion like that, it's almost guaranteed that that animal is infected with embovis. And then as um, infection progresses to disease, you then see lions that get very thin. Um, they have non-healing wounds. They aren't able to hunt and um, eventually uh, succumb to the disease. But how does it uh, occur from buffalo to other species that are herbivores? So that has been an interesting question. We know that buffalo transmit embovis to each other through aerosols or gregarious social species. But, but how does embovis move from, say, buffalo populations into uh, animals like rhinoceros? So we never used to um, think that we've had TB in our rhinoceros population. But we found our first case during a period of severe extended drought in 2016. And this was a black rhino that you can see was emaciated. We think that a lot of that was actually due to um, the drought um, and then TB contributed to it. And you can see it developed um, quite extensive pulmonary disease and also had uh, granulomas in lymph nodes. Um, subsequent to the drought ending, we have found embovis infection in other rhinoceros, uh, but appears to be less severe in cases where animals have uh, adequate nutrition. So that's an interesting um, risk factor for, for our species. We did do a follow-up of epi uh, epidemiological survey and using the interferon gamma assay, we found that um, an estimated 15% of rhinos um, have been infected. And again, the question is, is that significant? Can they transmit um, embovis? A lot of rhinos used to be translocated out of um, Kruger, both for um, safety and to repopulate uh, other areas of the country. Um, that is now no longer possible because we can't answer the question if a rhino comes and is infected and goes to another um, park, can it introduce embovis? So 
Um, that's an issue that we are currently trying to address. And you can see that animals obviously are sharing the same environments with buffaloes. But beyond that, there are also other reservoir hosts in Kruger National Park. One of them is the Greater Kudu. And in the upper left, you can see an animal that is thin. It has swollen lymph nodes in, in the neck and head. And these animals are browsers. And we believe that those lymph nodes um, can fistulate and actually drain and then uh, contaminate the vegetation. Um, it also, they have obviously great big thorns, which when animals are browsing, that can pierce and actually inoculate Ambovis from the um, vegetation into the head and neck tissues and infect the animals. And that's how we think um, for instance, giraffe have been um, infected through indirect transmission of vegetation. And there are lots of other interfaces. Um, animals come to water sources and they will um, graze or browse or um, you know, rest in those areas. And of course, if you have infected hosts, they can then um, contaminate the environment with Ambovis. And we believe that is how uh, it's spreading to additional species that um, we hadn't really been concerned about before, like elephants and warthogs and even mon uh, banded monkeys. So this raised the question of whether uh, ambovis can persist in the environment, especially in a, a fairly hot um, environment like Kruger and National Park. And we went back to the literature and of course, um, there's been increasing interest in looking at environmental persistence. Um, Amen and the groups in um, Ireland, the UK and the US have been studying this and have shown that indirect transmission can occur with Ambovis. And so that's something that we now are looking at because it's very important for the control or whether we want to do interventions um, with our wildlife. So we currently have a study in which we're doing environmental sampling for mycobacterium uh, tuberculosis complex. So human TB as well as Mbovis to understand indirect transmission. You can see that um, often these interfaces are quite um, close. This is an area near the Shishui on Filosi Park where you have um, communal uh, pastures, there's some goats, there's some cattle, and uh, just on the other side of the uh, picture, then the um, wildlife park is present where TB is endemic. So one of the things that, that is very important is, is looking at speciating MTB. So both in our animals and in uh, the environment. And I just want to give you a little story about um, how we found TB in, in Kruger in elephants. Again, this occurred during um, the drought in 2016. We found a 45-year-old African elephant bull that was very thin and actually had just actually died. So we were looking for the causes. We did a necropsy and we found that he had very extensive uh, uh, lesions um, consistent with TB. Because Kruger is endemic for Ambovis, we honestly believe that that was going to be Ambovis. But we went to the extra effort to do the cultures and um, speciate it and actually do whole genome sequencing. And we actually found that that was human TB. So now the question was, how did that animal become infected? Is this a part of the epidemiology that, that we've underestimated um, is people coming into the park or staff that are infected with M. tuberculosis presenting a risk to um, our wildlife. So that is something that we're currently looking at. And again, we did a, a zero surveillance study in our elephants and found antibodies to MTBC in about six to 9% of our elephants. So it's not a uh, once-off 
event. And there are many, many wildlife human interfaces in Kruger and in South Africa um, that we need to really start looking at that we hadn't looked at before when it came to um, TB in our wildlife. And you can see a few examples there. And there are also um, extensive wildlife livestock interfaces, um, not only in South Africa, but throughout the African continent. So we haven't really been able to get a handle on MBOVIS in livestock in Africa, um, primarily because of the resources, but also um, some of the stakeholder perceptions and concerns. So um, obviously the issue of, of TB and wildlife will continue. So um, this is just my little plug of saying that, you know, we spend a lot of time, and money um, and res resources, energy on trying to control TB in humans, but we really need to be um, looking at all the susceptible hosts in a system in order to really make that even a, a possible um, achievement over time. So again, I think we need to look at this old pro problem of TB in animals and humans from a new angle. And I hope that, that we're all working together to do that. So I just wanna acknowledge again, my absolutely amazing um, research group and all of our collaborators and funders. So hopefully you were able to hear that. Thank you. All right, fantastic. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. All right, so uh, I think we're open for questions. Um, would anyone like to turn on their camera and microphone and ask? Um, and then once we're done with uh, the personal questions, we can then go to the, the uh, online questions in, in the chat room. So, so anybody want to ask a question? All right. Well, while we're waiting for anybody to raise their hand, why don't we start with the online questions? Um, so this is for uh, Eamon. Uh, from uh, Makram Asafi. Uh, what BCG, BCG strain did you use and uh, what kind of assays did you use to discriminate between animals infected with M. bovis and those vaccinated or infected with atypical mycobacteria? Yeah, thanks Makram. Yeah, <laughs> good question. Uh, we started all of our experimental studies years ago using the BCG Pasteur strain because that was an agreed strain between ourselves, uh, New Zealand, various different countries. Uh, but unfortunately, sort of halfway through, or about 2005, the BCG Pasteur strain was stopped being manufactured. So we moved over to the, the Danish strain, um, and um, the, the strain that's used for, for, for humans. Yeah, and, and we did some studies showing that there was no difference, or we couldn't measure any differences in the leverage protection between BCG and Pasteur. Uh, that, that links into the second part of your question. Uh, these strains don't produce the important, these vaccine strains don't produce the important antigen MPP70. So all of our assays for infection uh, are based around detecting MPP70. So if we, in our assays, in our serological assays or in our gamut fear assays, if we, if we see responses to, to, um, to MPP70, then we're making the assumption that these animals are infected with uh, uh with, with embovis and it's not a cross reactive uh, response to bcg or any other atypical mycobacteria excellent thank you very much all right um next question uh from the satu sar uh the delivery of vaccines to domestic pets and livestock is a straightforward scenario compared to delivery uh to pest animals and wildlife populations. Uh, with wildlife vaccination, how are you able to achieve coverage of an appropriate proportion of the target population? Yeah, I saw that there, there, there is no easy way. So basically we have to pay people to spend their working lives walking around fields and looking for 
set entrances to where Badger lives. They're all recorded on a database. So we think we have probably mapped about probably 80% of the several hundred thousand holes in the ground that the uh, where the badgers live. So when we target an area, we, we do a fresh check to make sure to, to make sure we've covered all of the, the sets. And then we set our, our traps outside all of the sets associated with the uh, with a particular farm. Usually when we're vaccinating in one farm, we're usually vaccinating in several farms on the surrounding areas. So in in that way, we're maximizing the chances of actually getting all the or, or the, the the largest number of badgers in our population. But look, there there are badgers who are trap shy that we would always miss, uh, but we do seem to be able to capture the majority in an area where we know where all the sets are. Awesome. Okay, and the second question: uh, There's a need to support surveillance programs to maximize disease detection, such as uh, testing of strange acting animals. Uh, also, vaccination efforts need to be intensive enough so as not to encourage disease persistence by protecting animals that subsequently produce susceptible offspring, especially in areas of high habitat quality. Yeah, ex exactly. Um, I saw the, um, you know, and, and that's why once we start vaccinating in an area, uh, we continue to vaccinate that area and we continue to monitor the disease. And so, so some of these areas now, uh, even before the national program started, we've been vaccinating for for, for, for ten years. Uh, we do tag all the animals with a microchip, so we can see who, uh, how long animals have been in, in uh, what, what their vaccine status is, and and for how long. And any time a new badger comes into the population, we will we, we will uh, we'll do a test on it, a field site test, uh, and we will also uh, we'll also tag it. Yeah, which is just your previous question there again. Are there tests to distinguish vaccinated from infected animals to limit? Um, again, the, the the tests don't tell us that the animal is vaccinated. The 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 fact that the animal is tagged a microchip tells us that it's vaccinated. If they respond to MPB seventy, uh, then that tells us that the animals are infected. Uh, there's a few more there, Fred. Did you miss just just, just ahead there? I can go through them quickly. Uh, yeah. From uh, thank God, um, I want to know the mechanism of indirect effect of vaccination to non-vaccinated badgers. Uh, look, that that's what um, that's what herd immunity is all about. Uh, thank God. As you increase your population, then the the probability of a susceptible animal coming in contact with an infected animal is reduced through vaccination, uh, and therefore the the disease pressure in a population decreases, uh, and so those animals then get protected even though they're not vaccinated. They're still susceptible, but the probability of getting infected is much lower now because they're in the presence of a protected population. Uh, and above that, is there any potential risk to offspring of vaccinated badgers? Um, I'm not sure what risk you're talking about there, uh, but no, we can vaccinate cubs. Uh, cubs take about six weeks to emerge, and and if we get them, we will um, we will we, we basically we, we we will vaccinate them. I got one more question from uh, Leka. Uh, how did you reconcile or rather motivate interfering with wildlife population as far as vaccination is concerned? Uh, understanding is so far uh, there is usually resistance from regulatory bodies. Should something like this be proposed? Yeah, I think I, I think the, the most important point here is that the the, the badger is, is is recognized as a as an important ecological. Uh, wildlife species and and it's protected under national and international law. Uh, therefore, you know there, there there's a lot of opposition to culling the to, to culling the animal. Uh, whereas it's much easier to convince people uh, of the merits of, of vaccination because you know you're 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 basically trying to protect them from a disease and you're actually trying to protect them from from, from getting cold. And and I suppose our long term our, our our idea is that if we can remove the the badger from the equation of transmission, then it just retreats back into the background. Uh, nobody will care about it anymore. Um, and as long as nobody's talking about it, then they can just live out their normal wildlife lives without any interference. And that's what we're trying to uh, achieve. It's the opposite of New Zealand where the with the possum is a, is a pest and there's arguments whether should they cull or vaccinate it. But it seems because it causes so much ecological damage, uh, the, the, the attitudes there are much more in favour of, uh, of culling. All right. Well, thank you very much, Eamon. And I think we've got some questions for Michelle. Um, Michelle, what is the impact of the wildlife spread of M. bovis on human populations? 
Um, great question. Um, that really, it's going to depend where you are. So um, in South Africa, um, people do um, interact with wildlife through um, poaching, um, bush meat, and again, this is across the African continent, not just uh, South Africa. And uh, the other thing is that um, in some areas, wildlife are believed to be the source of TB spillover back into livestock. And so um, it's less of a concern in terms of people interacting with wildlife as it is that the wildlife will spill back into the livestock and then the livestock are in close um, contact with the herders or they use unpasteurized milk or um, oftentimes our rural livestock are slaughtered um, in the community. They don't go to an abattoir. So there's no meat inspection and that type of thing. So there is a risk of zoonotic TB. Um, obviously, Fred has done uh, quite a bit of work with zoonotic TB in other parts of Africa. And so it, it really depends on the, the context, I think, because it's so different from area to area. But um, yes, it is, it is a concern. And that's where we need to increase awareness, especially in, in some of the global TB strategies. Excellent. Thank you. Um, and then uh, we have some follow-up questions uh, from Harini. Um, question one is, have you employed any methods to diagnose wildlife TB in live animals? Some... Uh, yes, so we, um, for instance, the rhinoceros uh, epidemiological survey I mentioned used a um, blood-based assay, the uh, gamma interferon, um, assay that we had developed and modified, um, which is very similar to the human um, and obviously other things like the Bovgam and, and those type of things. So we have been using um, blood-based assays, cytokine uh, release assays, cytokine gene expression assays, and um, serological assays, just, just like Eamon has. And um, you know, our goal is to be able to diagnose infected animals anti-mortem. So that's underway. Excellent, thank you. And next question is, uh, would you suggest any non-invasive samples for detection of MTB complex in wildlife? Yes, so, so something that we're actually looking at now is um, whether we can um, collect fecal samples as a indirect way of measuring prevalence in the environment. Um, if you, we're still, that's still early days for us. And obviously that is um, something that's, that can also be difficult because in the wild, you won't necessarily know what individual uh, the fecal sample came from unless you're actually tracking or following the animals. Um, so one of the things that we're doing is trying to look at um, possibly sampling vegetation and soil in areas where we know there's a lot of wildlife activity. Right. And then uh, next question, what methods are employed to identify MTB complex in environmental samples? Um, also, great question uh, that we... <laughs> Because we have a number of controlled diseases in livestock in South Africa, including foot and mouth disease virus, um, we are restricted from moving samples that are potentially infectious from certain areas back to the laboratory. So in those cases, we actually will do um, DNA extractions and then PCRs. We do some targeted deep sequencing um, in areas where we can move the samples, we'll bring them back to the lab. We'll do um, uh, midget culture and then um, speciation using PCR and, and whole genome sequencing. Excellent. So, so I actually have a question too. Um, how pervasive is MTB uh, complex in elephants? Uh, 
so your screenings um, ha has it been expanding or is it is it just pretty isolated? So at this point in time, the only elephants we've been able to test have been the wild elephants in Kruger, and that's you know through some opti opportunistic sampling as well as um, a small funded study. So it's about six to nine percent based on seroprevalence. Um, as I mentioned, we've seen one case of MTV. The other cases that we found have been Um, We don't think it's having a significant impact on the population, but again, that has to do with context. So in the case of drought, and what our fear is, is that with climate change, as it gets hotter and um, drier here, that's the animals are going to be competing for resources and therefore they may be uh, more susceptible to actually developing disease. Yeah, very good. All right, um, <clears throat> does anyone else have any questions? Would you like to raise your hand or put it in the chat? Well, fantastic talks, uh, really enjoyed it, uh, great discussion.